let me just move on to the next one. Uh, we're running a little bit late, um, but I think we've got enough time for the discussion. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Dr. David Ferry. Uh, he obtained his PhD at ETH in Zurich in Sutherland in 2002. Uh, after a very nice and interesting CV um, and a lot of experience, in 2018, he became the group leader of the Applied Catalysis and Spectroscopy a group at Paul Scherer Institute. He is now working in environmental catalysis on practically all, uh, almost all exhaust after treatment systems for both stationary and mobile applications using uh, diesel and natural gas uh, fuels and, a, as you can see, alternatives as well. He's also developing in situ operand spectroscopy tools to analyze solid liquid interfaces, and uh, he's uh, now uh, given us this presentation on emissions control. Uh, the, 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 over to you, uh, David. Thank you, Augustin. You hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the for the nice uh, introduction, and thank you to the organizers for uh, this very nice uh, meeting, and especially for uh, inviting me to uh, to take part to it. Uh, I am the last one because we are in the exhaust after treatment, so at the end of all the uh, pipeline. Um, I must admit, uh, I am a chemist, so I'm really talking today from the perspective of the uh, catalyst that could be used to, uh, to treat the, the exhaust gas of the ammonia uh, uh, engines. Uh, let me do a very short introduction. I think yeah, we don't really need that, but it, at least it, uh, it hits me a bit up for my presentation. Uh, I think ammonia is really the, uh, the potential to become a key uh, component of the uh, circular economy of the future, especially when it is uh, together with uh, um, green hydrogen. Currently, it is already used a large scale as a, as a fertilizer, uh, as a chemical precursor. Uh, as we will see, it is also used uh, a lot in the uh, Denox technologies for stationary applications, especially, but also for uh, mobile applications. Uh, of course, it is a, a very suitable hydrogen carrier. Uh, there was also a question today about uh, methanol, but uh, ammonia also plays that, uh, that important role. Uh, low storage cost, uh, low transport cost than, uh, than hydrogen. And this is especially for the long uh, term demand, at least uh, what is uh, believed to be today. Um, today we are discussing uh, ammonia as a fuel, and uh, uh, I will show you something about that, of course, uh, as well. Uh, then it can be used, I believe, uh, without limitations, or could be used without limitations uh, for vehicles on road and off-road, uh, ship, trains, and uh, of course also for stationary, uh, stationary applications. Uh, it is, of course, a, a fuel with uh, uh, no or zero CO2 emissions, uh, which is very nice, but we have also learned or have very seen, seen very much today that the combustion characteristics of uh, pure ammonia are not uh, sufficient to avoid emissions of nitrogen containing uh, components, like for example, ammonia itself. So unburnt ammonia will be find, found in the exhaust of the, of the engine. Uh, there is also a lot of discussions how much NOx emissions there will be, and uh, we have seen also now from Christine that there are NOx emissions, uh, but also in the literature there are various uh, levels of NOx emissions uh, reported. So the solution to this is uh, um, blending with, uh, for example, hydrogen or other uh, or hydrocarbon-based uh, fuels, so natural gas, gasoline, diesel, uh, and so on and so on. And here I also report the same plot that uh, Christine has shown before with the various um, effects of the hydrocarbon-based uh, um, fuel on the uh, exhaust composition of, um, uh, of the uh, um, ammonia engine. And so the question here is now, and this is why I am here, is to see what is the role of the exhaust gas composition on what will be used to treat the exhaust gas composition. So, uh, if we are talking about ammonia, the nitrogen containing compounds, but there will be probably also the carbon containing compounds uh, coming from natural gas, gasoline, diesel, and I think we have seen this already today as well. So carbon monoxide, maybe unburned uh, uh, hydrocarbons and, uh, and so on. So I put together a summarizing slide. Uh, I looked for some papers 
uh, of yours basically where the the the, re, the NOx uh, or the um, emissions of the ammonia engine uh, are reported. So I'm giving here values that I found here and there. These are really maximum uh, values. So the gas composition uh, of the exhaust uh, of the ammonia engine with or without blending uh, will be characterized by, uh, of course, a large quantity of, uh, of ammonia. So this is the most important component, followed by uh, nitric oxide, um, uh, basically one third in this, uh, in this plot here. Uh, there is very little amount of NO2, if at all, uh, which is also fine. And then there is a big discussion about the emissions of N2O. I found uh, maximum levels of 100 uh, ppm. And I think this goes really much in the direction of what Christine has mentioned before. We have really to get rid of the uh, N2O uh, because of its uh, huge global warming potential. So you have seen before 45 ppm correspond to about 0.7 CO2. Um, it's not nothing. Uh, actually, this has to be controlled, especially for uh, the large engines. So the most, the primary, um, the primary action that we have to take is actually you who have to take, you have to develop engines who don't emit any N2O, right? You will see that afterwards that uh, controlling the emissions of N2O once they come to the catalysts can be very difficult. And therefore, we need to ensure that there is uh, no uh, N2O coming from the engine already. Um, coming to the temperatures of the exhaust, I found one paper, uh, at least, where uh, uh, temperatures are mentioned, uh, which are very similar to the typical exhaust temperatures of the, um, of the catalyst that we already have for the conventional uh, fuels. So this means that we can apply already uh, those after treatment systems that we, already, uh, that we already know, at least from the temperature viewpoint. So the secondary uh, action is, of course, to insert a catalytic converter, and that's why I'm here today, uh, that is able, in principle, to transform all these nitrogen component, con containing components into, uh, into nitrogen. And this catalyst typically uh, have uh, the shapes that you, you may see here. So typically, it's an active phase composed of uh, transition metals or uh, platinum group metals, depending on the application. Uh, supported on a so-called support material, so alumina, titania, uh, zeolite materials, and, and so on. And typically, this is shaped. It is shaped in the sense that it is, uh, this, uh, this powder is uh, wash-coated on a ceramic substrate, on a honeycomb ceramic substrate, or it is shaped into various shapes depending on the type of application, the flow, the, the pressure drop, and so on. And this is especially for the um, stationary applications, whereas this is more like for the uh, mobile applications because of the, of the volume uh, that is uh, uh, needed. Uh, so what I, I would like to do is to present what uh, is already known for the um, exhaust after treatment of other um, fuels, of the conventional fuels, and see how we can relate this to the uh, after treatment system of uh, ammonia engines. Uh, I will start with the gasoline uh, fuel uh, because I've found some studies where this is, was also applied. And uh, this morning already, Dr. Vo um, from Korea showed us their, their nice uh, vehicle running on uh, ammonia uh, with a three-way catalyst, actually two, two three-way catalysts and an ammonia oxidation catalyst. And therefore, this is also fully in the, uh, in the context of the, uh, of the meeting as well. But a a three-way catalyst is used to treat uh, in one step, uh, the pollutants of the uh, gasoline fuel, so of the exhaust of the gasoline engine, which are uh, unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and uh, NOx. This occurs in one go, and this means that the, um, um, the air to fuel ratio has to be really controlled at stoichiometry. So, there at stoichiometry, the catalyst will work at best. Uh, it should be noted that this catalyst works, and I think that's a lot of uh, research running, it works almost only using uh, PGM, so uh, rhodium, palladium, uh, platinum are required in order to have this uh, function of simultaneously abating the pollutants. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I introduced this because I found a couple of papers um, uh, using three-way catalysts, and this is the uh, one of those which is comparing basically a three-way catalyst for gasoline use or for a mixed, so a blend of gasoline 25% and ammonia. 
Um, you can see this is the typical uh, behavior of a, of a gasoline uh, three-way catalyst. You have here the equivalence ratio. Zero is the stoichiometry where the catalyst actually sends to, to work. And you see that uh, if you go from rich conditions, so deficient in oxygen to uh, lean conditions, uh, excess of oxygen, uh, you pass through this stoichiometric point where basically all pollutants are close to zero, if not uh, at zero. So here there is no report about N2O. Uh, this uh, is not automatic that there is no N2O uh, generated in the, uh, the three-way cat three catalyst. But I think the comparison with the blend uh, is very uh, significant. Here you see the same catalyst with this blend of ammonia and gasoline. And you see that, of course, under rich conditions, you have a larger emission of ammonia because you have also probably much more ammonia coming uh, from, the, uh, from, the from the engine itself. Uh, at the stoichiometry value, of course, all uh, pollutants are really uh, close to zero. But you see then these red dots, which represent uh, N2O. And this means that the catalyst itself, under those conditions, produces uh, N2O. Or maybe this was N2O coming from, uh, from the engine. So we really have to pay attention that this N2O is not generated by, uh, by the catalyst. Um, also, Christine mentioned the, um, the work of Toyota, which I summarized here from the viewpoint of the catalytic uh, converters that have been uh, proposed. This is a full system, relatively complicated, uh, that is basically laid out to the cold start of the um, uh, fuel, which is a blend of ammonia and hydrogen. So the first uh, part of the catalytic after treatment system will be a redox catalyst, which is nothing else than a, a three-way catalyst composed of uh, rhodium and palladium as the active phase, so relatively expensive uh, catalyst, uh, which uh, works as you see here. So by increasing the temperature, you have the concentration of the pollutants going down. Uh, ammonia and NOx at about 550 Kelvin, this is uh, done, so 300 uh, degrees maybe. But you see, very importantly, you get uh, by the same chemistry, the production of N2O. Uh, and this is made by the catalyst. Uh, then the exit of the, the exhaust of the catalyst comes to a catalytic absorber, which is represented here by these two plots. Uh, the catalytic absorber here was, due, was used, uh, was a, a zeolite uh, ion exchange by platinum or by, by copper. And this is the comparison. You see that basically the, the catalytic absorber is there in order to trap the ammonia during the cold start and release the ammonia in order to perform SCR uh, when the temperature is higher enough. And uh, this is basically shown here until about 400 Kelvin, you don't have any ammonia, at least uh, then it comes. And uh, when it comes, then uh, it is used to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the, remaining, uh, the remaining NOx that, uh, that will be there. You see the difference between the two catalysts. Uh, with the copper, you still have NOx, so it's not a real, um, uh, really useful for, uh, for the purpose of this study. You see that the platinum based catalyst actually reduces completely all the NOx to zero, but, uh, and the ammonia as well. But the question is about the N2O. You also see there that as soon as you have a, a platinum group metal element, you uh, generate in this case about 100 ppm of, uh, of N2O. So this is really a challenge to get to remove all the nitrogen component uh, containing compounds without generating N2O. Now I move to the next uh, after treatment system, uh, which is that of the diesel um, fueled uh, engines. Uh, so all the engines that, uh, you know, large scale uh, um, on the road, uh, on uh, rail, uh, ships, uh, stationary applications, and so on, would run with a similar um, uh, layout. Um, the layout is uh, basically more complicated because you have, uh, especially for the uh, actually essential only for the uh, small uh, for the vehicles, you have a diesel oxidation catalyst, which is used to oxidize hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide to uh, to CO2, uh, and also NO2 uh, NO2 in when it is present. Uh, the diesel oxidation catalyst. Then the exhaust of that catalyst basically is mixed with a, a stream of ammonia. So ammonia is dosed into the exhaust gas because that ammonia will be used to reduce the NOx that are coming from the diesel oxidation catalyst. So NO and NO2. And this reaction then is so-called uh, uh, SCR, the selective catalytic reduction um, reaction that we have also seen several times or heard uh, several times today uh, in the presentations. 
So this part of the um, of the after twinkles after treatment system of the diesel fuel uh, fuel engines is the part which is, in my opinion, the closest to what we would probably need for a, uh, an ammonia engine. And uh, I would like then to go a bit more into uh, into detail there. So typically, you have the SCR catalyst, uh, which is based on a transition element, so not expensive, uh, not so expensive like a precious metal. And typically, this is followed by an ammonia oxidation catalyst uh, that take care, takes care of the uh, ammonia slip that could occur in the SCR. And this is again a PGM-based uh, material. Now, the, the ammonia, which is dosed, typically is dosed in the form of urea, and then it's hydrolyzed uh, into ammonia, uh, is dosed really to follow the stoichiometry of the uh, stand, so-called standard uh, SCR reaction, which is shown here. Um, however, already for the low concentrations of, uh, or the lower concentrations of NOx that we, uh, that we have in the, in the typical engine uh, diesel applications, you see that uh, the reality deviates from the uh, from the theory. So basically, the, it's not true that all the uh, ammonia that you put in really reacts uh, with the uh, NOx. And at some point, you will have also a, a slip of ammonia uh, from the system. And this is very significant. Uh, it's also for uh, those low concentrations of NOx. So we are talking about 1,000 ppm of NOx or uh, lower. Uh, concentrations. So you can imagine that when we introduce uh, a higher concentration of NOx, then there would be even more um, uh, slip of both ammonia and uh, NOx. Of course, this is an extreme case. Uh, these features that you see here can be, of course, optimized by, uh, by using a suitable catalyst. And this is what is done currently for the diesel uh, applications. So based on what I've mentioned now, this is what I would propose as a uh, a possible uh, layout for a, um, an engine um, a fueled by, by ammonia or a blend of ammonia and uh, fuel. And I'm just taking into account all the nitrogen containing compounds because I believe that uh, it's maybe easier to take, take into account the, uh, the carbon containing um, components that might derive from the, from the combustion. So we start from uh, uh, the exhaust of the engine that contains uh, let's say high concentrations of ammonia. Uh, we have seen in the slides before, high concentration of NO. It might contain some uh, concentration of uh, N2O, and there we really have to take care that uh, this doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. And uh, these um, nitrogen containing compounds can be treated uh, in the selective catalytic reduction catalyst. We already have ammonia, so we don't have to dose ammonia uh, additionally. And uh, there, basically, the SCR catalyst will take care of uh, reducing the NOx uh, and, of course, uh, abating also part of the, uh, of the ammonia. This means that uh, after the catalyst, there will be probably still ammonia present. Uh, hopefully, there will be no N2O, but this has to be taken care of. And this ammonia then has to be uh, oxidized to nitrogen uh, very selectively. And this typically occurs or could occur on an ammonia oxidation catalyst that uh, is represented here. Uh, here we have really to pay attention because an ammonia oxidation catalyst is typically uh, a platinum group metal um, based material. So platinum, for example. So first of all, it's expensive. So we have to evaluate whether there is any chance to install this on a large scale um, engine. And second, the platinum we have seen before or the PGMs may have issues of uh, selectivity. So we may at this point even generate NOx and uh, or N2O from oxidizing ammonia. And this is something that we really need to, uh, to avoid. And there is where research should really go to uh, uh, dedicate space to really um, develop catalysts that are not doing this. Uh, because now for the small scale diesel engines, uh, I mean, there is ammonia oxidation catalysts, um, which are may be active, but the selectivity is still uh, an issue. And therefore, uh, all the engine that we are discussing today, I think it's important that we don't get NO and N2O at the end of the tailpipe. Uh, this is a typical SCR catalyst based on vanadium and how it works. So here you see, uh, as a function of temperature, the conversion of NO, so the NOx, 
in this case only an O, and the conversion of ammonia um, in the case of ammonia oxidation. And uh, you see that in principle, uh, the catalyst is active, very active until 450 degrees. Uh, this also depends on the content of vanadium. These are really typical catalysts in uh, honeycomb shape, uh, used also for uh, stationary applications. Uh, you see that they are very active, but above 450. So in the temperatures that we are uh, also talking from the uh, ammonia engine, you see that you start to lose the conversion of NO. And this is because the ammonia actually prefers to react to, uh, with oxygen. So it gets oxidized um, by, uh, by oxygen. And unfortunately, this type of catalyst generates, uh, generate um, uh, N2O. Um, another type of catalyst is the one uh, um, represented by zeolites, iron exchanged by iron. And there you see that the catalysts that are more active at higher temperature, and they are also less active for ammonia oxidation. And when they do ammonia oxidation, there is uh, practically no end to, of course, depending on the type of material that is used. Similarly, the copper exchange zeolites, uh, where now copper is the uh, active phase, are active on a very wide uh, temperature region, also very low temperature, also below 250 degrees and have a very poor ammonia oxidation um, activity and therefore also poor N2O formation uh, capability. So these materials are really something that one would think of uh, inserting in a, in a catalytic after treatment system of the ammonia engine. Now let's take care of the N2O. The N2O is something that we don't want to have. And uh, uh, actually if the N2O is present in the feed of the, uh, of the engine, um, of the exhaust of the engine, we see that actually we know from some experiments as shown here from iron exchange zeolites that actually N2O can promote the uh, selective catalytic reduction using ammonia. Uh, only this occurs at above 300 degrees, so in a higher uh, temperature region. We also know very similarly that ammonia uh, can promote uh, the N2O decomposition, so the, basically the N2O decomposition to nitrogen and oxygen in a simple feed, uh, but this reaction doesn't really take care when there are more complex um, feeds as the ones that we, that we know from the ammonia engine and from the normal fuel engine. So here it's really N2O decomposition when N2O is alone. But also in this case, you see that uh, um, ion exchange zeolites are very active for, uh, for this reaction. They promote the um, ammonia enhanced and to other composition. To end up with, uh, I would like to show one slide about the ammonia oxidation catalysts, uh, which are used to oxidize the slipped in ammonia into uh, nitrogen. Uh, these are typically very much used in, uh, in the nitric acid plants uh, because their ammonia is oxidized on platinum gauges. In the emission control technologies of vehicles, uh, these are nano catalysts. So it's basically uh, nano dispersed platinum, for example, on alumina, which is used to oxidize ammonia at very low temperatures, so uh, 200 degrees. And uh, as you see from, from this plot over here, so at 250, the ammonia is basically oxidized. The only problem that we see with platinum, and that's what I showed you before, is that the, um, the selectivity might be an issue. And you clearly see this in this, uh, in this plot where, yes, ammonia is oxidized, but at some point you get NOx, and at some other point you also get uh, nitrous oxide. And these are really two products, especially nitrous oxide, that you don't want to get. So the challenge is really to combine the catalyst for uh, SCR and ammonia oxidation catalysis so that at the end, we really have a very selective um, system, which produces only nitrogen. So the one response to this uh, or answer to this uh, uh, challenge is the uh, bifunctional uh, ammonia oxidation catalyst and selective catalytic reduction catalyst that is, for example, shown here, which basically allows you uh, ideally to oxidize ammonia to NOx on the uh, AOC catalyst and uh, uh, to uh, react directly ammonia with the NOx present in the feed to do the SCR. And the NOx, which are produced from the uh, AOC catalyst can reduce with the excess ammonia present in the feed with the idea that we generate uh, only nitrogen. So there is a lot of research at present going on in this direction to have this bifunctional catalyst to increase our uh, selectivity to nitrogen. So the challenges are really to 
uh, also test the catalyst under the high uh, levels of NOx and uh, ammonia that are present in the real exhaust of an engine uh, fueled by, uh, by ammonia or blends of ammonia. And then the, the question is there whether we, we can use such uh, AOC catalysts as well containing PGMs for large scale applications like marine. So to conclude, uh, yes, ammonia is, a, I think, a, a potential fuel for the future. Uh, I think we have shown today that it can do. Uh, there is no solutions, but there are other, other emissions that we need to treat, absolutely. Uh, there is possibility to uh, control these emissions, depending especially on the levels of concentrations that we may expect, but it's not, not challenging, right? So it's challenging still to, uh, to face this, uh, uh, these emissions, and therefore research has to, to start in that direction. Uh, so we have high levels of ammonia, much higher than uh, NOx. Uh, we have to avoid absolutely N2 emissions from the engine and from uh, downstream of the catalyst because the catalyst can make uh, N2O, as I showed you before. And this is especially on PGM, which become then very critical, not only for the price and not only for the large scale uh, applications, but also because they may do N2O. So research has to go into the direction of testing the catalyst under conditions that we have never tested so far, for, so for high concentrations of ammonia and the NOx. Uh, uh, considering also complex uh, mixtures, ammonia, N2O, and NOx. And of course, this is a very nice chemistry. That's very intriguing chemistry. We have to understand the reaction mechanisms in order to, uh, to develop a catalyst. And I would like to conclude with a note on catalyst development. I think because ammonia is a, probably really sold for free. I mean, ammonia itself, yes. I don't know the operation of the, um, of the full engines. Because it is a few, uh, sold for free fuel, we can basically rediscover elements that are very active for uh, ammonia oxidation and um, SCR that have been forgotten simply because they are very sensitive to, uh, to sulfur. And one of those is, for example, manganese, which is, again, a transition element and therefore also relatively cheap. With this, I would like to thank you for your patience. I would like to thank you to thank Christine uh, because she enthusiastically brought me into this topic a couple of years ago, and I'm happy to be, uh, to be there. I would like to thank all the uh, group research group uh, that I'm heading and also the research partners at uh, uh, funding agency and companies uh, that are basically supporting our after treatment uh, research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Davide.